Thank you everyone for joining. I am really glad that you were able to make it today. Uh, we have a small session today, but we are recording this so people can view later on. And I realized that I didn't change the date, but this is the February information session. We've been doing these monthly to ensure that folks have a sense of what is coming up with the H-1B lottery and uh, learn more about open avenues and the cap exempt H-1B visa solution for foreign nationals who don't lose the lottery or want to come into the country at some other point throughout the year uh, outside of that annual cycle. So we're going to get started. My name is Danielle Goldman. I am co-founder and executive director of Open Avenues Foundation. Um, Open Avenues was founded in 2018, and we are founded to demonstrate that diverse global talent from around the world can catalyze positive outcomes for the United States, for both the US economy and for society at large. And we built the Global Talent Fellowship Program to both open pathways for foreign nationals to stay and thrive in the United States and work for organizations or start companies, and also train the future US workforce in STEM and in business fields. So everything that we do is a win-win for foreign talent and also for the US. Let's talk about the H-1B challenge because many of you know about an H-1B but are here to learn about the cap exempt H-1B. Uh, the H-1B poses a major problem to foreign nationals and to their employers because while it's the most common work visa in the United States, it is capped annually at 85,000 per year uh, and picked at random in a lottery system in March. Uh, and this has resulted in a pretty restrictive process. Uh, some of you on the call might have lost the lottery multiple times um, while you have been on OPT. For other folks coming into the United States, they have this one chance annually, but if they wanna start at a company uh, in September, uh, it's very difficult to wait until March to see if they win the lottery and then wait until the new fiscal year when that actually becomes applicable in October. So a cap exempt H-1B can be a good solution for that. Um, foreign nationals to be qualified for a cap exempt H-1B also have to be qualified for an H-1B. It's the same qualification. So you must have a specialty uh, a degree in a specialty field. So the Department of Labor calls them specialty occupations, and there's a long list of specialty occupations in the United States. Uh, and an individual must have a degree that is relevant to the work that they're doing in their specialty field. So the most clear cut and common uh, situation that we see is a software developer working for a tech company or finance company uh, and coming in with a degree in software development or degree in computer science. Very strong H-1B, very clear that they have the degree related to the field that they're working in. Um, not so clear, an English degree for someone working in biology. Um, that's a really tough H-1B. There's always you know, some ways that we can try to figure out how to make things work, but obviously the more clear cut it is, the stronger an H-1B petition is for, for the U.S. Immigration Services. The uh, reality of the H-1B is that uh, there were more than 300,000 applicants or registrants into the lottery last year, which was a 12% increase from the year before. The cap remains at 85,000, so you can understand how this becomes more restrictive year over year. And uh, about 45% last year were selected in either the first lottery, there were multiple lotteries after to get to that 85,000 and fill that cap. Um, but overall about 45% of folks were selected in the lottery. And obviously we know that the cost of losing foreign talent can be very, very high for companies. So it's in the best interest many times to figure out a plan B. What, do, what does a company do or what does a foreign national do if they want to keep that foreign national working for them, even if they lose that lottery? And so that's where cap-exempt H-1B visas can be a really great solution. Number one, cap-exempt uh, visas are not subject to the annual cap of 85,000. They can be filed and approved at any time of year outside of that annual cycle. Uh, and they can be filed pretty quickly. Um, so I put in open avenues timeframe in here. We do these in six to eight weeks for our part-time employees or our fellows. 
Uh, and the keto cap exempt H1B is they can only be filed by organizations that have been deemed cap exempt by Congress. Um, so the legislation says there are four types of cap exempt organizations in the United States. There are nonprofit research organizations, universities, government research organizations, and nonprofits that are partnered with universities. So if you work for one of those types of organizations, fantastic. You can be sponsored immediately for a cap exempt H-1B by your full-time employer. But if you don't, one option is to work part-time for one of those types of cap exempt organizations and then have your full-time employer also sponsor you for a cap exempt H-1B. And that is what we're gonna talk about here today, how a full-time employer can benefit and how you can continue to work for your full-time employer by being in a part-time cap exempt H-1B. So that's where the Global Talent Fellowship comes in. Open Avenues runs this fellowship program for foreign nationals that want to work for Open Avenues for five hours per week as a fellow. And during that time, all of our fellows are leading real world company challenges with university students at our partner universities. So I don't have the picture here, it's actually at the end, but Open Avenues is partnered with seven universities, mostly in Massachusetts where we're based, but also around the country. We have a partner in Florida uh, and Illinois as well. Um, we're always looking to partner with new universities. So if you have strong connections with the university and would like to introduce us to them, uh, we bring all of our programming, all of our fellows bring these projects and programming for free to our university partners. That's really our charitable mission and what we aim to uh, do to train the future workforce led by foreign talent. So the fellows work for Open Avenues in a variety of fields. We said you just need to have a specialty occupation, a really strong specialty occupation to be qualified for an H-1B. And we look for fellows that have strong qualifications in fields that have uh, high growth. You know, where is their where are their future jobs going to be in the United States? And can we bring fellows on board who are going to train students in those fields? So right now we have folks in software development, data science, web development, uh, biotechnology, bioinformatics, microbiology, marketing, finance. Um, there's more <laughs> operations, research. Um, they get pretty intricate, um, but the high level is if it falls in STEM or if it falls in business, um, there are opportunities to work with Open Avenues Foundation as a fellow. So uh, the types of projects we launch, there are three kinds of projects as if you're working with Open Avenues Foundation. Uh, one are micro internships. These are five week projects where students actually get paid to participate in a challenge with you. Our fellow is the leader of those projects. They are the ones who are going to um, launch them with students, make sure students are successful in those projects and help them get through and really take something from start to finish. Boot camp projects are paired with a partner stack education. Uh, they launch boot camps at, par at universities and we bring these challenges uh, that are about 10 to 14 weeks to those projects, uh, to those boot camps. And then we have in-class projects where we work with a professor at a university. And during that semester, one of our fellows will actually launch a project throughout the course of the semester that's related to the curriculum that one of our uh, university partners is, is trying to teach students. And so the way that this really works is you start your fellowship, we place you in either a micro internship, boot camp, or in class project. You are going to launch projects with Open Avenues. Um, we aim to have fellows launch about three projects per year. And we offer career support and help students ultimately get placed in jobs. So that's what the fellowship aims to achieve. And as many of you are going to be most interested in, how does this interact with a visa? So if you sign up to be a fellow or your company nominates you to be a fellow, which is the critical piece there, uh, you would go through the visa process with us. So number one, a foreign national uh, realizes they need to have a plan B to the H-1B lottery. Um, and we actually, at this stage, we do not take foreign nationals directly into our fellowship. We partner with companies 
that want to retain their current employees. So if anyone's interested in the fellowship, you can't just apply with us directly. You actually have to have a company nominate you and say, we're willing to pay for the fellowship uh, and also sponsor the, uh, this employee for a full-time visa once they're in cap exempt H-1B visa with open avenues. So um, open avenues, we'll talk to the employer. We will learn more about the company and if this is a good fit for the company. Um, and then we evaluate the eligibility of the foreign nationals. So we'll make sure that a potential fellow is qualified for an H-1B visa, that they're interested in the program, interested in launching projects with our partner university students. Um, and we go through that evaluation process first. If we accept someone into the program, then we will immediately start to work on a cap exempt H-1B petition. So we file this petition typically within four weeks and it takes two weeks to get a response, uh, 15 days to get a response from USCIS. So this filing process to get an approval once we contract with a company takes six to eight weeks. Then once an individual is approved with open avenues in cap exempt H-1B as a fellow, immediately your full-time employer that nominated you for the program is eligible to sponsor you for a cap exempt H-1B themselves. Now your full-time employer is, does not qualify as one of those four cap exempt organizations, but the law says that once an individual is in cap exempt H-1B status with a cap exempt organization like Open Avenues, it opens the door for your full-time employer to also file a cap exempt H-1B visa at any time of year, even if the company is not cap exempt. So your company would immediately file that visa as well, and you can start working for them the day that they file. So the process really should go six to eight weeks before you get approved with open avenues, and immediately there should be a quick turnaround where you can begin working for your full-time employer. And beyond that time, you're gonna remain employed by open avenues and remain in the fellowship for as long as it's necessary. So uh, until you win the lottery, until you get a green card, until you qualify for a different visa type, you stay a global talent fellow. Most of our fellows exit the program when they win the lottery. Um, so many folks are entering the lottery this March and they're also going to be applying for our program so that they're in cap exempt H-1B status. And if they win the lottery, they're going to transition in October into regular H-1B. Uh, other folks will end up getting started with us in July and they'll have to wait until March uh, for the next lottery cycle and see if they win then. So really it's about timing throughout the year in terms of how long you're in the program for. We do have a six month minimum in the program and that allows us to put on some really strong uh, programming with our university partners. So partnering with Open Avenues Foundation, uh, the companies get a lot out of this. So if you're an individual going to your company and you're gonna bring this solution to them or you're on this call and you are a company yourself, uh, the idea is that when you nominate a fellow for a fellowship with Open Avenues, there's also a lot of benefits that the company is getting uh, from having this. So yes, of course there is a, uh, uh, the, there is the immigration solution for foreign nationals, so the cap exempt H-1B solution, but this is also a leadership development opportunity for foreign nationals to actually manage a group of students, teach them um, about uh, in their, you know, related to skills and skills related to their field of expertise. Um, really learning how to manage a group of students is an amazing opportunity to refine presentation skills, um, to learn to talk about your work to a group that is new to the field itself. Um, and also, this is an awesome pipeline development opportunity for companies that are looking to hire and expand, especially in entry-level roles. So uh, when our fellows launch projects, they're getting access to a group of students that are trying to enter into that field and potentially will be applying for internships and entry-level jobs in the near future. So this is a great way to get access to those candidates and of course, this is amazing social impact and community development work. Um, we're working men with many community colleges and technical institutions. So providing that opportunity for students to get paid and work on a project for your company is, is pretty cool. 
Um, so of course, some of the qualifications for fellows, um, if a company wants to partner and nominate a fellow is that we're looking for fellows who, uh, are, who, who you are willing to sponsor for an H-1B as well. So a company needs to say, we're going to also sponsor them for an H-1B visa. They have to have a bachelor's or a master's degree in a STEM or business related field. And experience mentoring or working with students is a huge plus. If there's been any times where a fellow, where a, a applicant has mentored someone in the past, um, you know, been a TA in a class, uh, that's all really helpful experience as we consider partnering with a company and, a, and bringing on a fellow. And then also English proficiency, of course, um, most of our fellows have accents. Most of our fellows, English is, all of our fellows, English is their second language. Um, but of course, we're, we're trying to put on some really strong programming for our university partners. So that's important as well. And of course, when a company nominates someone for the fellowship, there is a fee and a commitment to, uh, a financial commitment to Open Avenues Foundation. So there's a one-time fee of $12,000, which includes the cap-exempt H-1B visa and our filing fees and allows us to scope those projects and work with universities to get those placed. And then once an individual is approved and on board with Open Avenues, we charge a quarterly fee because as we said, everybody's in our program for a different amount of time. So uh, we charge $3,300 per quarter and that goes to university students and allows us to continue to operate our programming. And then here are our partners. So we have our seven university partners over on the right and we have about 30, this can expand to about 35 now, um, company partners that are engaged with us in our programming across a variety of fields. So um, really uh, excited about all of those partners. And we work with Goldman and Partners Immigration Law on open avenues visas for our fellows, but we partner with individuals, uh, with, with law firms that any company uses. So if any of our company partners already have an immigration law firm, we're able to partner with them uh, and actually use them for the concurrent visa. So your law, the law firm can maintain um, their own legal team and I, uh, our team at Open Avenues works with that law firm to, to get these visas approved as well. So that's how we're working. Um, that's the program. I realized someone joined late um, and hopefully caught some of the end of that, but uh, happy to answer any questions. I like to spend most of these uh, sessions in a Q&A because I know that uh, it's most helpful to get some real-time thoughts and questions about the program. So if anything didn't make sense or you want more information, please hop in and ask some questions about timing. Uh, and then we can uh, hopefully get to each of you. So if you want to hop on video uh, or if you want to just hop on voice, that's awesome. Hey, Danielle, can you hear me? I can, Jasper, yeah. Hi there, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for, for walking us through the info session. That's super helpful. I wanted to see if you could give a bit more detail on what the evaluation process in your end looks like and if there's anything candidates can do to sort of um, improve the likelihood of their candidacy. Absolutely, yeah. So the key to the evaluation process and the first step is we make sure you have a strong H-1B. Um, so Jasper, I've actually talked to your law firm. Um, I'm working with them on this evaluation, uh, I, I, learning a little bit more about, we get transcripts from everyone and we get resumes and we look to, to see in the Department of Labor Handbook, which specialty field do you fall under? Now, for folks who are in business and have a bachelor's in biz, a business-related field, sometimes this can be challenging because it's less specific. Um, it's harder to tell exactly what the focus of a business degree is because business is not a specialty occupation. Marketing is, or market research is. So. If there are plenty of courses on marketing or market research, we'll go with a marketing specialty occupation. Financial analyst is a really good uh, 
uh, specialty occupations. So if it, for a business degree, we'll look and see, are there enough finance courses? Um, so you can, see, you can see from this that what we're trying to do is make the closest tie possible from education to a specialty occupation. And the stronger that is, the more likely someone is to get accepted into our program. Open Avenues Foundation has a 100% success rate with our fellows getting approved for cap exempt H-1Bs. And the reason is because we do a really thorough job up front to make to do this evaluation and make sure that that specialty occupation works um, and that the approval is uh, is likely because because of that tie between the education and, and the work that's being done on a daily basis at your company. Um, the other things that we're looking for are any experiences, as I said, in mentoring or um, working with students in any way. So we look forward to hearing um, more about those experiences. And if you reach out to Open Avenues, we can um, we can you know learn more about that. Okay, sounds good. That's that's super helpful. Well, first of all, thank you so much for for over overseeing that that evaluation process for me. I wasn't sure if you personally um, was involved in that process, but really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, and that that sounds that sounds really good. I'm not sure if my my lawyers sent you sort of. I wrote a little paragraph or brief about sort of why I would be a good fit for the program. I'm not sure if they passed that over to you, and if there's any other material that um that uh you know mm -hmm. would be would be appropriate or would be helpful in, in my candidacy. I yeah. I would love to send them over. Um, Great. not sure if giving my email would be the best avenue since you already have that channel with with my lawyers, but yeah. Um, yeah, just wanted to sit, drop that, mention that here in case. Yeah, and I actually already wrote down to contact you after this because I know okay. you have a really tight timeline. So Aaron and I are going to be in touch right after this. Okay, sounds good. Thanks so much. Looking forward to that. For sure. Uh, Sarah, I saw you have a question about, um, about the process for folks that already... Hold on, I have to get rid of this other thing. You said... Um, for folks that have OPT ending right after the lottery, this is a really good question. When is the best time to start the program? So right now we're seeing a lot of people who have uh, OPT ending May, June, July, trying to think right now if uh, they lose the lottery in March and you find out really the first or second week in April, what happens, um, what is the plan B? So there's, there's, there's uh, two ways that companies decide to go. There's a most conservative approach. Uh, and then there's, there's the le least conservative approach. Um, but number one, some companies decide that they want to get into cap exempt H-1B visas immediately um, and, and still enter the lottery, but have a cap exempt H-1B visa as a backup plan um, and secure that so that if they lose the lottery, the employee is already in cap exempt H-1B status. So it like put, takes the pressure off. Uh, for June 1st, it's a tight timeline. It's doable uh, to, to, to start after. Um, and, you know, April 1st contacting us and saying, we just had an employee lose the lottery and we want to move forward today with a cap exempt H-1B visa. That's, that is absolutely, uh, that can work. The other option is to, to reach out and do an evaluation with us first, get into our system, um, make sure that the employee is eligible, uh, go through some of those logistics so that on April 1st, if the individual loses the lottery, we can just immediately contract um, and move forward with the petition. So I would say that would be the most, uh, there, I guess that is the medium, that, that is the happy medium would be to do a lot of the evaluation process first and then uh, contract with us after the lottery, most conservative, and I just had a company move forward with this right in a call right before, was they just wanted to have this done, have the individual, they, they can't lose the individual and they wanted to move forward. And um, because of the June date just being really close and, and tight with that six to eight week timeline of our approval, um, they wanted to move forward now. So. I don't have a clear answer for you, but um, you can really, we can talk about pros and cons to, to each approach. Now, if an, if an individual starts in cap exempt H-1B status before the lottery and they enter into the lottery, 
they're going to remain in cap exempt h would be status until October 1st. And on October 1st, uh, before October 1st, your company would file a regular H-1B visa so that the individual on October 1st transitions out of our program and into cap exempt H-1, into regular H-1B status with your company. So you're looking at being in the program from March until October. If you move forward bef before the lottery, if you wait and you see if they win, you don't, there's what's called cap gap. So for anyone in, in uh, OPT who wins the lottery, they can stay in OPT all the way through October 1st. And so you're basically not gonna have to pay the cost of the Open Avenues program if you wait until the lottery, see the results, and then if they win, move forward and they get to use their cap gap. If they start in Open Avenues program before, they don't have cap gap because they're in cap exempt H-1B, not OPT. Um, so there's pros and cons to waiting and, and uh, moving or moving forward. Sarah, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, for sure. Anyone else have a question um, on timing or the visa itself? Um, I had a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. So once the process, once the company uh, can transfer the cap cap, uh, cap exempt H1 to the employer, um, can the employee make a switch to another company and what will the process look like? And does the cap exempt H1 still remain with the new company or should it be a right. exempt H1? Yeah, really good, really good question. I wanna address the first thing you said first, which is um, when an employee gets, when an employer, uh, a full-time employer gets their approval of a cap exempt H-1B visa, an employee must remain employed by Open Avenues Foundation. So you think of it like there's like a baseline of the cap exempt H-1B. Open Avenues kind of is that baseline. To maintain cap exempt status, you have to be employed by the cap exempt employer. So if you take open and, and the the full-time employment, the cap exempt H-1B is dependent on that baseline. So if you take away cap exempt H-1B with open avenues, you lose cap exempt status with your full-time employer. So our fellows stay in the program until they get into a status with their full-time employer uh, directly, meaning a regular H-1B, a green card, um, or other another visa type. So I just want to clarify that folks stay employed by Open Avenues Foundation. They don't just switch to their full-time employer. It's concurrent employment. You're employed by both organizations while you're in cap exempt H-1B status. Now to answer your second part of that question, yes, you can switch employers. Um, we've only had this happen once uh, and I'll explain how it works. So as I said, once you're in cap exempt H-1B status with Open Avenues, any private employer can piggyback, we call it. It's a concurrent employment. They're basically kind of tagging on to our open avenues cap exempt status. So your full-time employer that you're currently working with is going to be that piggyback visa. They're going to immediately get, in, get you into cap exempt H-1B status with them. Now, if you wanna switch that full-time employer in the future, you can. Um, but they would need to sign a contract with Open Avenues and they would need to start paying the, the quarterly fees for the program. So, and they would basically, all they would have to do is file a cap exempt H-1B visa also. So that can happen at any time of year. Um, so it's possible. Uh, we did have one individual want to go do this and he had another company sign with us and he left his previous employer. But for Open Avenues, we ask that, you know, you, we don't have fellows leave their employer, then spend a few months um, figuring out their next move and staying in cap exempt H-1B status. It's a requirement that our fellows are employed by a full-time employer. Perfect, thank you. That's helpful. Great. Anyone else have any questions? Oh, uh, I had one, uh, sorry, I joined a little late. Uh, so I might not have heard, and I'm sure you That's must okay. have covered it, but uh, the cap exam H-1B, can it be filed at any point in time during the year, or is it just regular mm -hmm. March? 
Yes, it can be filed at any time of year. So that's really one of the main values is it's for people inside the United States who are, you know, have OPT expiring at different points throughout the year. Uh, and then also for folks outside of the United States who might want to enter in uh, at, at various points throughout the year. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, we have fellows coming in each month and NJ, I think we'll probably I'll send the recording out to everyone. Um, so everyone can, you know, review um, pieces of this because I think it will be helpful probably for you to listen to the earlier part where we talk about what a cap exempt H1B is and um, when they can be sponsored. Yeah. Anyone else have questions? I, um, we have plenty of time. So if anyone wants to talk specifically um, about their situation, I can also answer those questions if there's nothing else that's general. Danielle, really quickly, if we did want to move forward with starting the evaluation for our employee, what is the best way to get that started? Is there like an intake sheet or do we just reach out to you directly, have them reach out with, or work through our attorney? Yes. Um, Aaron's, Aaron can put her email. Actually, Aaron is immigration program coordinator, so she can put her email into the chat um, and you can reach out to her and we'll schedule a consultation. Um, so we would do an intake uh, call with you um, would be the first step. And then we have, uh, we would, that would be the first part of, of the evaluation is just getting a little bit of information through that call. And then we would move forward with collecting transcripts. And we have some documents that we would take from about the specific individual to do the legal evaluation with our law firm, actually. Um, and of course, if simultaneously you have a law firm that needs to be aware of this whole process and that we'd be working with on the concurrent visa, we might just want to loop them in and let them know about the process. Um, so really, if you want to move with that path of doing the evaluation prior to the lottery, um, the goal is just to cover as much as we can um, before the lottery happens. And that includes, you know, getting your law firm tied in, um, maybe having folks at your company look over the look over the, the template contract we have with open avenues, things like that. Great. Thank you. For sure. Great. Anything else from anyone? I realize we're <laughs> sped through that presentation today. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, everyone has Aaron's email in here. Um, so feel free to reach out to, there's Aaron. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Aaron, do you wanna introduce yourself briefly and then they, everyone knows who they're uh, reaching out to? Totally. Hi everyone, my name is Erin Carlini and as Danielle said, I recently joined as the Immigration Program Coordinator and two of my previous Dukies are on the call. So it's <laughs> nice to see Andy and, and Jay as well and get to see you again after a couple of years. So yeah, great to meet everyone. Wow, I love that. That's amazing. Um, really cool. So yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining today and please reach out to us if you need anything and we will uh, look look out for some some notes from you, and we'll send out the recording, of course. And Jasper, we're going to get to you right after this. I'll send you an email. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thank you. Of course. All right, everyone, take care. Thank you.